Hello, I'm Robert Costa, and this is the Washington Week Extra, where we pick up online where we left off on the broadcast. Let's talk about President Trump's national security team and the officials who were with him when he was briefed about the Syria strike this week. David, when you look at this picture, what does it tell you about the inner circle? Well, first, the most important thing in any decision a president makes is who do you invite into the room? Okay, so you look at this, and the room was a little bit unusual because they were doing this in Florida. They weren't doing it at the White House. So there were a few people in this picture who probably wouldn't have been in it had this been going on in the Situation Room. Wilbur Ross is there, the Commerce Secretary. Steve Mnuchin is there, the Treasury Secretary. Not the people you would necessarily invite in for a Syrian strike conversation. There's one woman in the picture, the rising star of the NSC, Dina Powell, uh, worked for uh, President Bush, then went off to go work for uh, Goldman. Uh, I've known her for a number of years. She's a serious strategist. She's sort of emerging up within the, the NSC. Um, Steve Bannon was in the picture. So just days before, Bannon had been removed from the Principals Committee of the National Security Council by H.R. McMaster, who's sitting in a spot at the table where he and Bannon probably really couldn't see each other's eyes. I don't think that was completely, uh, completely uh, by coincidence. And of course, Jared Kushner is there, sitting opposite the Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson. There's a little bit of debate in Washington about which one of those is really the Secretary of State. <laughs> well, plus, uh, Bannon doesn't get to be at the table, but Jared does. I noticed That's that. That's right. Oh. Bannon was hanging back a little, but he did that before as well. Yeah. Also, look at President Trump's body language. So if you think of that iconic photograph when they're going after bin Laden during the Obama administration, Obama is just in from golf. He's sitting at the corner. He's sort of, you know, he's sort of like watching this. Mr. Trump is bent over. He's got that same look he had when he was driving that 18-wheeler, uh, uh, you know, or, or up in the cab of it. You know, he's leaning forward. You know, he's all intensity. One thing we should add, though, is they were not watching Tomahawk yes, missiles right. in real time. Exactly. What they were watching was the vice president and the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and they were having a conversation. That's a, a less gripping, uh, no offense to the vice president, but that's right. a less <laughs> gripping image than watching. Watching a special yes. forces yes. team. Agree with that. Absolutely. Right. Also, there were no American human lives at risk in this raid, whereas, of course, in the bin Laden raid, there were many. And Bannon just keeps reappearing. He appeared at another National Security Council meeting earlier this week, according to the White House. Even though he's not on the Principals Committee, he's still part of the He has walk-in privileges to go sit into these. And so, you know, he's sort of the zealot of this, this week. He didn't show up at the press conference with King Abdullah, but he did show up for the missile strike. But the backdrop of this is, of course, is all these stories that are suddenly appearing in the press about the rivalry, the tension between Steve Bannon and Donald Trump's most trusted advisor, his, his son-in-law, son Jared law. Kushner. We got that right here in the Post today. Wrote about it with my colleagues about Kushner and Bannon were close during the campaign, but they've really had this split apart. But it brings up another point, Karen. President Trump may be considering a staff shakeup to deal with some of the power struggles that you're talking about inside of the White House. There are reports that Chief of Staff Reince Priebus may be on the chopping block in the wake of last month's health care mess. Karen, what do you know about Priebus and his standing inside of the West Wing? Well, Reince Priebus, I, I talked to him shortly, I did a profile of him shortly before he took the job, and he said, look, you know, I'm not going to be in this job forever, in part because this is easily the second hardest job in Washington, and in part because Chiefs of staff don't last very long. When things go wrong, very often the White House Chief of Staff is the first person to take the blame. The second thing is that Reince Priebus has never been, you know, truly, truly, truly in Donald Trump's circle of trust the way some of these other characters in the, in the White House are. And so again, when you're when you're looking for a fall guy, he's a he's a likely candidate. Are any of the names that are being floated believable based on your reporting or is there, this is all about people in Washington who have allies or confidence they want to see as chief of staff floating names well one thing you've got to you've got to wonder is whether somebody who has other options would even want this job <laughs> at this point and at this chaotic moment but yes this is this is the moment where when when you have rumors of staff shakeups that's where people start just sort of throwing names in for for no apparent reason and at least no apparent evidence 
And it seems like whoever gets that job should Priebus leave, whether it's in six weeks or six months or a year, it's going to have to probably be with Jared Kushner's approval. That's right. And, and he is, uh, that's the other thing that as people talk about Jared Kushner's influence, he's shown that influence time and time again when it comes time to get rid of people. Michael, you have an interesting story in Time Magazine this week about the incredible shrinking power of the president's threats. His mocking, sharp tweets and insults have become part of his signature communication style and it helped him eliminate a number of GOP challengers in last year's primary race. But what's changed in terms of Trump's threats? So, so Trump's political brand, somewhat like his business brand, was one of domination. He, he was the guy who dominated anybody else he was next to. And if you came after him, you know, with a club, he'd come back after you with, you know, a building. I mean, he, he, <laughs> would, he, would, he would light up the stage and, and, and outshout anybody. And it was interesting to watch during the health care debate there were several points, usually privately, he and his staff tried to do this again with blunt threats um, saying, you know, if you don't do this, I'm coming after you. And basically everybody he did this to in Washington, moderates, conservatives, laughed it off. They, they are not scared of him. And I think it's been a, a very humbling experience for a not very humble guy to have to figure out um, that, that the power to threaten uh, is not what it used to be. The big, best example of this was last weekend, he went out golfing with Rand Paul, who he had attacked viciously for more than a year, you know, belittled regularly. Um, and he went out to play golf with him on his terms and then let Rand Paul go to the cameras afterwards and talk about how they had a great discussion about health care and were making real progress, which was basically code for I'm winning the health care debate, uh, you know, with the president. So, so it's a real shift from where he was before. And I think, like I was saying in the show, this is a guy who likes wins. He wants to, he likes keeping score. He wants to know he's winning. And I think what he's realized over the last two or three weeks is the system he set up when he came in was not giving him a lot of wins. So I think a lot of this is a, a reevaluation. Which of could well drive him to more foreign policy mm -hmm. because it's the one area where he can operate pretty much on his own authority. People complain in Congress, but People complain in Congress when presidents have acted unilaterally in both Democratic and Republican administrations. He's going to discover more over time. He's got more freedom in foreign policy than he does, obviously, in tax policy, in health care, or anything else. Uh, and, you, and you can tell in the White House they're very, very conscious of this 100-day formula that, that we in the media have about what is a president doing and what is he achieving and, and how successful and how many wins. And uh, they were, you know, getting a little concerned this week because it was looking like a lot of zeros. Gorsuch getting a, the Supreme Court seat filled is a, is a win. Uh, deploying missiles, if you're a new president and you've got Russia standing up and paying attention, that's probably a win. But legislatively, we're not seeing those wins. And as Michael's suggesting, the president is, is trying to figure out not just a system, but what techniques does he need to conquer a city that he said he could conquer easily during the campaign, I drain think, the swamp? I think this goes back to, the, look, we're covering the Jared uh, Bannon drama, but there's, there's another issue here. Ryan's previous was brought in because he had close ties with Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan said to the president, I have a plan. Trust me. I'll get you tax reform. I'll get you Obamacare repeal. And then we'll go for infrastructure. It's not working. And nobody really has a plan now. Paul Ryan was out. Uh, this week, I think, saying, well, we're not really sure what we're going to do on taxes, which is huge from where he was a month ago, saying, we have a plan, we're going to pass it through. So I think the president is looking at his staff. You know, Bannon said, we got a plan. Ryan's Priebus said, we got a plan. And no one has a plan. So he's going to have to figure that out. And part of that is probably going to be personal. David talked about Dina Powell being an ascending force on national security and foreign policy. She also is an economic advisor to the president. Yes. But Alexis, who we, who's the president looking to? to help revive health care tax reform. Is it Gary Cohn, the national economic advisor to the president? And is it Vice President Pence? Mm -hmm. Who? Well, the, I think the president has more confidence in his economic advisors who have from the beginning been formulating their own thoughts about what the tax plan should be. And I, I'll offer this example. Because we know that Speaker Ryan came at this idea with the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, of a border tax and that they had this great formula for a, for a tax plan and everyone in the Senate is telling the president there is no way that this plan is going to be passed in the Senate and his own economic advisors are saying that may not be the direction that we should go in. The president has naturally, I think, looked at them with more confidence, just the way he's looked at the military advisors with much more confidence that they seem to know their, 
the profession and how things work. So I don't think the president's answered that question quite yet. Was his legislative director at fault? I don't, I don't think he could say exactly that. Is the vice president at fault? No, he deployed him to go try to see if he could rescue healthcare 2.0. And that didn't work before the break. So we'll see. I think he definitely wants to make sure that they iron out the funding for the, for the government at the end of the month and not have a shutdown. And then we'll see what happens after that. And I do think the lesson of health care is, too, that the administration is going to have to actually get down into the weeds on policy. They cannot outsource this to the Hill. In all the palace intrigue, the one person I keep coming back to in my notebook is H.R. McMaster. He doesn't do interviews doesn't do speeches, but this National Security Advisor, along with Dina Powell, is really s seeming to be a powerful force within the West Wing. And if you could push around Steve Bannon in this White House, that's power. Yeah, he's an experienced player. The thing to remember about H.R. McMaster, and I've known him a bit for uh, a number of years, is he wrote the definitive history of what went wrong in the relationships among the generals and the politicians that led President, to the disaster of the Vietnam like War. And those lessons with have stuck with him. He is now converting the National Security Council to something that looks a lot more like Brent Scowcroft's National mm -hmm. Security Council in the George H.W. Bush administration, considered to be sort of the model of how this is done. And that helped that move to that model helped him get a political figure in Steve Bannon off the principles committee. That book it came out in 1997 called Dereliction of Duty. I'm, I'm telling you, when I walk around Capitol Hill, it seems like almost every senator is reading Dereliction of Duty. Go, go look at the Amazon ratings. I mean, I've, I've rarely seen a book that came out 20 years ago shoot up the charts the way this has. Yeah. Well, the main one of those lessons, by the way, was, out of Vietnam was that the general should have stood up and said no when they saw that things were going wrong. Yeah. Said, stood up to the president. All right, that's it. For this edition of Washington Week Extra, while you're online, check out six interesting facts you may not have known about the just-confirmed Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch. And of course, as ever, the Washington Weekly Quiz to test your knowledge of current events. I'm Robert Costa, and we'll see you next time.